This morning we continue in our study through the um, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And so if you go ahead and open your Bible there, I've been in this series of messages for probably, I don't know, six months, seven months now. And uh, so we're just progressing each Sunday. We just take whatever's the next portion of the, um, uh, the sermon that Jesus preached on the Mount. And we go through that and see what he has to say to us. The good thing about it is that when we go through books of the Bible like, like we do at Lakeland Church or through passages like this, you don't get to skip and pick and choose. <laughs> and so sometimes that's a great thing, but other times the preacher has to preach it. <laughs> and um, so today is again one of those uh, that we deal with something that is very prevalent. The last time I was in this passage, we spoke about lust and we spoke about um, sexual sin as we went through verses 27 through verse number 30. Now, today we pick up in verse number 31, and this deals with something that is very prevalent in our culture, and that is the topic of divorce. And so, Jesus has this to say about divorce. In Matthew chapter 5, and I read to you from verse 31, it was also said... So let's just stop there and understand again the context of what's going on. This is not Jesus um, saying that uh, the Bible used to say this, but now I say this. What he is doing is he is confronting uh, the teachings of the Pharisees and how they would twist the Bible uh, to be able to fit their own self-righteousness. And so he's not saying what the Word has taught is wrong, but he is saying the way that they've been applying that, the way that they have been twisting that, it's not it was written, but you have heard it was said. And so this is their teaching that he's referring to. He's not rewriting the Bible, as some would say Jesus did away with and added new on. No. Uh, in fact, one of the passages that we have gone through already, he said that uh, not a dot or a tittle in the law of God will pass away, but it will all remain. And so he's not removing anything. He is, in fact, elevating and emphasizing this, the, the, this teaching. So here it is, Matthew 5, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. We need to realize and understand today that there is much attack on the family unit today. Whether we see it passing through our legislature with same-sex marriage, or we see the relaxing of the importance of marriage in the home, whether we see it uh, throughout our society where marriage is dumbed down, uh, easy in and easy out, I want you to know something, that marriage is very important to God. In fact, marriage is the first institution that God Himself ordained. Right at the Garden of Eden, he would say to Adam and to Eve, for this reason, a man will leave his parents and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, he said that to Adam and Eve who had no parents, <laughs> and how important this would be. The marriage is very important. The family is very important. Uh, if I had to ask you to raise your hand, which I'm not going to do, I am certain that within this congregation, either you are divorced or have been divorced, or you have parents who are divorced, or you have children divorced, or you have been affected in some way or in some fashion by this thing called divorce. And anyone that I have spoken to that has been through divorce would tell you that it is probably the worst thing to ever go through. It is painful. It is difficult. It is life-changing. Uh, 
it is one of those things that you would never wake up and say, well, I'm going to get divorced this morning. Or you were a little child in school and that time when you said, when I grow up, I'm going to become a fireman. When I grow up, I'm going to become a nurse. When I grow up, I'm going to be divorced. That's just, we don't do that. Because we understand that it is a very difficult thing and it harms people. And so we are so grateful for the grace of God, that God is a God of grace and love and that he can mend and restore and reconcile that which has been broken and hurt. And so as I speak this morning, I understand very clearly that there are many in this room that have been touched by this thing that we will speak about today, divorce. Let me say right up front, uh, as someone said to me maybe a week or three weeks ago, I was saying to this person, a lady in our church, I've got to preach on divorce and you know, it's, uh, it's gonna be tough. And, and um, this person said, well, for many years, I felt like divorce was the unforgivable sin. I want you to know it's not the unforgivable sin. And I want you to know that we have many in our church that have been touched by this. But it's not God's perfect plan for your life. And at Lake Road Church, we uphold marriage. We desire that people treat marriage in a very high esteem. The sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of the family is of utmost importance. And so as I speak this morning, I pray that you would hear God's word on this and not Anton's opinions. And I pray that there would not be anything in my demeanor or in the the language that I use that would be offensive to you, but I refuse to cherry pick God's word. And so we teach what Jesus taught and we uphold his standards. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is Jesus' teaching on divorce. The context of this is that Jesus is speaking He is speaking to the many that have gathered around. He is speaking to his disciples. And more explicitly, he is now going to be attacking the Pharisees, the teachers of the law of the day, the religious ones that would take God's word and twist it and change it. And in fact, when you understand the context of this teaching, which is found in Mark chapter 10, you'll see a greater teaching. And so I'm going to be spending time this morning in various passages dealing with this one thing. In Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, it says, And he, speaking of Jesus, left there and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And the Pharisees came up in order to test him. Underline that in your mind. There's a testing of Jesus going on here. And asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female female. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. That's a very strong terminology. The idea of leaving here is the idea of abandonment. Now understand, it's not abandoning in the sense that we abandon never to look anymore, but it's the idea of cutting ties and to cleave or to hold fast with all one's strength to one's spouse. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. 
It's a very clear teaching. Now understand that these, in this discourse, the, the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to get him to choose a side. They're trying to make him either be on the side of Shemaiah or they are trying to get him on the side of Hillel. Two rabbis in that time and they had two different views. The view of Shemaiah was the, was the teaching and view that is very conservative. And it would go as far as to say this, no divorce any time ever with no remarriage ever. Shemaiah. Then there was Hillel. Hillel was also a rabbi of the time. And Hillel would teach this, divorce for any reason at any time is permissible and even prescribed. Very liberal. Uh, that chose to do away with any sanctity of the marriage. Today, we have four different views. There's the secular view. We all know what the secular view is, right? It's a free-for-all. Uh, it's a free-for-all. Uh, if you even decide to get married, otherwise just go ahead and shack up and live together and expect God to bless that. Uh, but the secular view is, is this, that it does not matter. Hey, it's just another contract. <laughs> you could contract in, you contract out. But we, are, we forget that when God put the marriage together, He said the two shall become one flesh. This is a, an amazing thought. And so the secular view is just a free-for-all. Then in churchdom, if you would, biblical teachers argue and discuss in three different ways. And I believe that there's only one of these three. There is those who I would call the hyper conservative backslash legalists. And they would say this, that there is no such thing as the possibility of divorce and there shall be no remarriage. In fact, they will even put you out of the church if you go ahead and divorce or if you decide to remarry. They are legalists. The second is those that would say, well, divorce can be allowed in some circumstances but never a remarriage. I disagree. I believe what the Bible teaches, what Jesus teaches, is that divorce and remarriage are possible under certain circumstances. Divorce and remarriage are possible under certain circumstances. So, okay, Anton, prove it. That's what Jesus is speaking. So here is not just a division in the Bible that they were divided on this issue, but even today people are divided on this issue. So I want to say this, the only thing that can bring us together under agreement is when we look at the Word of God and we submit ourselves to what God's Word says. So it no longer becomes someone's point of view versus someone else's opinion someone's experience versus another person's experience, but it comes under the authoritative word of God. What does God's word say? So let's have a look at exactly how it is distorted and how then it is fixed. Firstly, the Pharisees used to command, used this command by Moses as an excuse for divorce. It was their excuse. So this is the way it would look. Now, we understand in those days, women were very much looked down upon. A woman had no rights. Uh, they were treated like trash. Uh, she was very dependent upon, um, dependent on a man to be able to survive. Uh, unlike today, if there was ever someone who liberated woman, it was Jesus himself. And so in that day, a uh, husband will get home and food's not ready write a certificate of divorce and say, off you go, get me a new one. And this sounds like silliness, but it was happening. You burnt my toast. Don't you know I like two sugars in my coffee and you only put in one. Uh, you looked at another man. You didn't dress the way I want you to dress. You didn't do the books like I said you should do the books. You, you didn't, and so whatever it was, it became an excuse for remarriage. You're too old. Uh, I want to trade you in on a younger model. Or, or maybe you're too young. I can't handle. I need to trade it on an older model. I don't know what it would look like. But it was heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. In fact,
fact so heartbreaking that many families would be torn asunder because of this distortion by the Pharisees that said this, that you can divorce for any reason you choose. Well, how do you know they thought that? Well, listen to this. I'm going to read you many passages. I've asked them to put them on the screen for you. Mark chapter 10, verses two through four. The Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And so they came up in order to test him, asking him this. And he's, he answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And this is what they were referring to in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one through four. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then he finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some, underline this thought in your mind, indecency in her, he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs out of his house. And she then goes and becomes another man's wife. And the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination to the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you an inheritance. It was a strong indictment. It was a great warning. It brought about defilement. So this is the way they put it to Jesus in Matthew 19. They come up and they test him, Matthew 19, verse 3. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So obviously now speaking of the idea of not, not both sexes or not the same sex in marriage. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So... They are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses, not commanded, but Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So now you have Matthew 5, Matthew 19, and Mark 10, Jesus teaching the same thing. Jesus is very unambiguous with regards to marriage and how marriage is for always. Jesus is very clear with regard to how God set it out in the beginning. In fact, in the book of Malachi, the Bible says that God hates divorce. That's powerful, powerful language. So let me speak about the design of God. What is God's design then? If they were distorting this thing that people could get married and for any reason just kick their spouse out and take another, what was God's design? In a perfect world, what would this look like? What is it that God would have for you and I? today? Well, I think firstly, we need to understand that there is an initiator and there was the initiation of marriage. The initiator is God himself. This was not a man-made decision. This was not somewhere along in culture, we decided, hey, it will look cool to wear a wedding band or hey, it would be cool for us to be married. No, the initiator is God. And God initiated that which is absolutely perfect. He initiated at the time of creation. Listen to this, Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. Genesis 2, 20 through 24. 
the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So this is essentially God bringing these two together. And he brought them to the man, and then, he, then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And then God says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this is before the fall. This is God initiating. He doesn't say uh, the, the, they shall be united and she shall be called a friend. She shall be, no, she shall be called a wife. And the terminology that's used here is marriage terminology. This is God bringing together and placing them together. That's the initiator and the initiation. Well, why is it? What is the intention? Of marriage, why did God do this? Uh, was it because He just had nothing better to do with His time? Uh, maybe He wanted to set up an eHarmony or one of these dating sites. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you what the reason is that He did this. Here it is. Firstly, it was for multiplication. It was for reproduction. Uh, it's so that they could reproduce and and they could multiply. That was the first and foremost reason. The second reason was the idea of togetherness, or I'm going to use this word, oneness. Said for the man, there was no helper found. And so God creates a woman compatible perfectly for him that she might become the helper, that they might become one together, oneness. And the two shall become one flesh. pleasure. You don't hear this preached from the pulpit much, but sex is a good thing, by the way. In the realm of the marriage bed. Any, any sexual action, attitude, or thought outside of the marriage bed is sexual immorality and is an abomination to God. Fire is a good thing in the fireplace. It'll warm you and it'll cook your food. But when you put it up in the woods and let it run rampant, it will devour. Sex in the, in the marriage bed is a blessed thing by God. But outside of the marriage bed, it will devour pleasure. The intention was that of permanence. Permanence. The two shall become one flesh. That which God has joined together, let no man separate. And lastly, it was the beautiful picture of Jesus and the church. You know, we refer to the church as the bride of Christ and he is our groom. Well, where do we get that? Well, throughout the scripture, we know that the groom is coming for the bride, but more specifically in Ephesians chapter five, there is told of us that the man should love his wife as Christ loved the church, even giving himself for her to purchase her with his blood. Men, this is a beautiful picture. Every time you love your wife, you have an opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ for the church. The love of Christ was a sacrificial love. It was an unconditional love. Uh, you get to demonstrate that. And then in Ephesians 5, it says that the wife should submit to her husband even as the church submits to Christ. Ladies, when you're coming alongside your husband and you're being the cheerleader for your husband, as you're helping your husband, as you're working with your husband, as you're submitting to his authority in your life, you are giving an awesome opportunity to show what it looks like 
the church submitted to Christ. The marriage is a beautiful picture of Christ and the church. So add divorce into that picture. It does not fit. But there is an interruption, an initiation with intentions, but there was an interruption. What is that interruption? Well, you'll remember way back in this place called Eden, uh, Garden of Eden, and we have sin entering the world. And now where the wife is meant to be submitted to her husband, respecting her husband, now she desires to dominate her husband where the husband is meant to be loving the wife and giving himself for the wife and leading the wife, now he wants to be harsh with her. So we need to understand that we do live in a context in which sin is very real. But having said that, that is not an excuse uh, for us. We need to understand that Christ paid the price for all sin. And he is more than able to reconcile and restore that which is broken. So I encourage you today, even though there was that interruption, that there is an awesome God that is able to take care of it. So, Anton, what do I do? You know, my husband is just a pain. I mean, this guy, he speaks to me like I'm a piece of trash. I mean, this guy, he is just terrible. Can I divorce him, please? I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. But you know, he's really not a nice guy. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. Well, Anton, you don't know my wife. She doesn't clean the house. She doesn't iron. The food's never made like I want it. And, and, and you know what? I don't even think that she's a good mother, okay? I, I think my kids would do a whole lot better with another woman in the house. Can I divorce her? I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. Why are you harping on this, Anton? I'm not. I'm giving you the biblical answer of the question you asked. Divorce scripturally is only permissible in Jesus' teaching for one thing, and that is sexual immorality. The word that is used is a, a word in the Greek, porneia. That may sound fam familiar to you, porneia. Uh, and today, that's where we get our word pornography from. Uh, and so what it was speaking of was not just the, the thought of um, a, a physical attraction to someone else uh, and, and a physical act of adultery, but it covered all areas of, of sexual sin, homosexuality, um, pornography, um, uh, the whole nine yards. In, in fact, let me go back with you to show you how serious it was. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, porneia. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye would cause you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better than you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. And then directly after that, it was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of porneia, makes his makes her commit porneia, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits porneia. How these link together. 
And next week we will see, again, you've heard it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or by his throne. Now he's gonna speak about keeping our oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I don't believe that the Spirit of God put this in here haphazardly, but he's spoken about sexual sin. Now he puts in divorce of a marriage, and now he puts in about letting your yes be yes and your no be no, keeping your vows. I know this is a tough passage. So what do I do? The Bible allows for dissolution of a marriage, divorce. I believe that divorce is allowed in a certain circumstance and remarriage in certain circumstances. So what are they? Here it is, Matthew 5, 32. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on grounds of sexual immorality. Jesus never, ever prescribed divorce. Did you get that? You, you can't leave here without getting that. Jesus never, ever, ever prescribed divorce. But there is one instance in which he allowed it, and that was sexual sin. Does that mean that as soon as you've, you've experienced um, unfaithfulness in your marriage, that immediately you, it's prescribed, you have to go ahead and divorce your wife? I say, thank you, Jesus, by the grace of God, my wife did not divorce me. what the Bible's speaking of is a continuing on, a continuing on. In other words, this becomes a pattern. This person has uh, repented, and then again, and then again, and then again, and some people are so flippant and blatant, they'll say, well, the preacher can say what he wants, I'm going to do what I want, and if you don't like it, hit the road, Jack. That person speaks like that's lost, headed for hell. The Bible is very clear that God desires reconciliation and restoration. So this morning I was ministering to some men, and I don't think I'll be breaking trust by speaking about this. Speaking about sin, and all of a sudden this one man starts weeping. And he says, I've got a problem. So this is in a service just like this. So, well, sir, what's the problem? I'm waiting for him to get up and tell me I'm the problem. <laughs> and he says, my wife and I are separated. I have a girlfriend and she has a boyfriend. What must I do? My response to him was, sir, you need to end that relationship immediately and be reconciled to your wife. And he looked at me and said, well, and he got very quiet. And then the answer came, for no adulterer will enter the kingdom of God. In other words, if he had continued in that adulterous affair, the reality is he was never saved. Anyone who can continue in that is proving that they're not saved, lost. So after the service, he came and sat next to me, just tears, and said, you know what, I needed to hear that. He said, because my wife and I have been saying, maybe God wants us to get back together but we just don't know. So let's just see what God does. I said, how's that ever gonna happen when you both got lovers? And he said, we were so blind, I didn't even think of that. So I said, so what do you think God wants you to do? And his response was, end it immediately. Be reconciled to my wife. A 
It's amazing that that happened this morning before I was about to preach this. So is divorce allowed? I believe yes. When there has been sexual immorality, the Bible says that there can be a divorce. I don't believe it's prescribed, but it is allowed. God always desires restoration and reconciliation. There is a second one, though, that Paul introduces us to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm going to run there very quickly with you because I know your time is up. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse 10, and I want to read to you from verse 10 through verse 15. This is the apostle Paul writing, and he says, to the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. So this is the Lord speaking. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I not the Lord, that if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. So this is that question. I came to Christ today and I go home and I tell my wife, I'm saved. And she says, well, whoopie doo. Can I divorce her now? Because she's lost and I'm saved and she's got a total different worldview and she wants to live for, for whatever and she disregards God. Uh, can I divorce her? No, not as long as she, she chooses to remain in that home. And if any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So this is the man, this is where the woman gets saved. Hey honey, I'm home. And she's like, You've changed. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm saved. Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the believing wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is said, they are holy. Now listen to verse 15. But, this is now the, the other exception. So the one is porneia, sexual immorality. The next one is but if the unbelieving partner separates. So this is, hey honey, I'm home, I'm saved. And she's like, I'm out of here. If that happens, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, that brother or sister in Christ is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Two reasons in the Bible for divorce. Pornea, sexual immorality, and the abandonment by a non-believing spouse. Those are the only two reasons the Bible gives. So what about remarriage? The Bible protects the innocent. According to God's word, Matthew 5 told us that if um, one were to marry a, a, a person who... Um, was divorced in the sense of that person is the um, offending party is wrong. What happens to the innocent? What happens to the innocent? So let's get very personal. So everybody knows my background of alcohol and sexual deviancy. When my wife was faced with a choice, she was innocent, still is. Most godly woman I know. What if she chose to divorce me because of my sexual deviancy? Can she never remarry? The teaching of the Bible is this, she can because she is protected by God in the innocence. God protects the innocent. So now you're saying, oh my goodness, 
what do I do now? Because we've all been touched by this, haven't we? We sure have. I think there's two things that we need to do. The first is, the sanctity of the marriage needs to be protected. Sir, ma'am, if you are considering divorcing your spouse for anything other than sexual immorality or the abandonment of an unbeliever, and you have not tried everything, you need to try them again. There are only two circumstances that the Bible would, would, would allow them. And you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to give it your everything. I encourage you today. Your marriage is very important. You have to fight for your marriage. You have to give yourself fully. Well, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried, but the spouse of mine, they just want to keep on in porneia. The Bible allows it, but it will come with pain. Sin always brings pain. If there's anyone in this room you're considering divorce, and it's not for biblical reasons, to do so would be to sin. And I would strongly encourage you to rethink that. I would strongly encourage you to do what God has called you to do, to be reconciled, to be restored. So I think the first thing that we have to understand and we have to grasp is that the marriage and the family is very important. There are children today that are 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, children. I call them children because they have been through divorce. And they're looking back on those days and say, I remember the day that mommy and daddy got divorced. Just funny enough, yesterday, met a lady whose dad walked out on her when she was four years old. She remembered him holding on to his pants, bridge, pants legs, begging her daddy not to leave chose to go she's 49 years old now every day going through counseling because of a divorce young people marriage is very important you get that you need to listen marriage is very important one day when God brings a, a, a young lady for these men or young men for those ladies back there, young lady for you too, when God brings one in your life, I pray that he will bring a godly husband or a godly wife into your life. But how about this? You need to keep yourself godly that when you're brought into someone else's life, you're the godly husband or godly wife. Keep yourself pure now for your spouse to be. Does that make sense? Divorce destroys families. Let us protect that sanctity. But secondly, what if you've been through that? What if you've been through that and you're like standing and saying, wait a minute. Guilty as charged, divorce without these grounds. What must I do? Well, those that can be reconciled, be reconciled. Those that have remarried, I think the second part is this. Let's extend grace. This is not the unpardonable sin. God can take the, the mess, the, 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 the ugliness, the, the trash that's been in our lives, that that has broken you and hurt you, God can take that and he can use that for you. I pray that you will not leave here today feeling defeated. But if there is a need for conviction, I pray the Spirit of God will convict you so that you'll not be able to stand up. But if there's a need for encouragement and comfort, I pray the Spirit of God will descend upon you and will comfort you. If you have been touched by divorce, as your pastor, I want you to know this. I understand your pain. 
I have counseled more than enough divorces to know that there is very little that can weigh up to the pain and hurt that that brings. But you know what? God's still got a plan for your life. What's in the past is in the past. It's gone. Let's not cry over spilt milk. Let's get on with life. If there's things you have to fix, go fix them. Do what you gotta do. But for those of you who are, have not made that mistake yet, or for those of you who have not been put in that position, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. There are enough people seated in these chairs that'll be able to sit you down for hours and hours and hours and tell you with tears running down their faces about the pain that has come because of that. Do not do it. Don't do it. But if you're already part of that, God's grace is so sufficient. His forgiveness is so awesome. And His love for you is absolutely perfect. You just need to walk in that freedom that Christ has given to you. Protect your marriage, church. Some of you may be in a second marriage. Protect that marriage. You can't go back and fix the first one. Protect that second one. It's important to God. This is what God has in store. And you have a beautiful beautiful opportunity of showing what Christ in the church looks like by loving your spouse. Amen? Would you stand as we close in the time of altar? I don't know what the Lord has said to you, but this altar is open right now. You come. Just come and pray. You come and pray right now. God has spoken to you impressed upon your heart things you need to get right with him things you need to entrust with him would you come and pray right now you may be here this morning and you're not saved and and you need Christ would you come would you come you may be living in sin and it's time to get that thing dealt with and get it over with turn back don't go on down that road of of uh Immorality, that, that road of depravity, that road that's going to lead to your destruction. Parents, now's the time. You need to be taking note. Your actions today will affect the future of your children. Statistics tell us that 52% of all marriages will end in divorce. It's more than half. More than half. Adults, pray for your kids. Husbands, be men of God. Be spiritual leaders of your homes. Ladies, follow your husband. Love Christ. This altar's open there. Those that are praying, you come. We're in no hurry this morning.
our hearts and those things that we have all gone through, you know, the hurts and those things that nobody gets to see and only you alone know, I want to thank you, God, that you're the God of restoration, that there's no such thing as a hopeless situation for you, that you can breathe hope into any and every circumstance. So, Lord, I pray for each one in this room that you would work your will and your way in their lives, that you'd make their hearts sensitive to your Holy Spirit. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.